The real topic that the, Nate asked me when he said, would you come speak, he says, uh, you know, we just want to know what's wrong with you idiots at the insurance company. Why don't you cover things like xylitol and other things? And I said, well, that's not a very good topic for me since I am one of those idiots at the insurance company. So I do represent about uh, 15 million covered lives. Most of them are Medicaid-related lives. And we're the third largest dental insurer uh, in the United States. So uh, this is something that we are uh, interested in, that we are excited about. We really want to change uh, the outcomes for, uh, for uh, dental education and dental outcomes. This is probably a picture all of us have seen out of our window of our hotel. Uh, we got here, it was a, a little windy, I'm sure, that you uh, understand, but I want to talk to you a bit about the concept of insurance first, how it works, how it's funded, and then how we can use uh, uh, that funding mechanism to change outcomes for people by funding some of this prevention. So I used to work for uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Texas. I was the president of their dental company there and that's where insurance first started in the United States. It was uh, about 1920 and the school teachers in the public schools in Dallas uh, they would get pregnant and they would go to the hospital and they would have a baby and it would be a financial burden on them. So all the teachers said if they could get together and put a quarter uh, a month into a fund then whoever was having the baby could use that fund to help pay for it. And that was the start of uh, insurance in the United States, and in fact, the start of the Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, system. It was in 1974 that, uh, that, that they added a dental product. And then it was shortly after that uh, that I started to work for them. But what in the world is insurance? Now, insurance is really geared to uh, protect from catastrophes. Now, whether it is Blaine, the way he drives, whether it is Nate, who can't quite find a landing strip before his plane runs out of gas and he lands on a highway. Whether it is uh, Shirley's husband, Mark, who was being blown right off the planet when he got here. Or whether it was our dancers yesterday. That was very nice, but uh, they're trying to balance these things on their head without losing them. Uh, you know, we're really trying to protect against a catastrophe which is not exactly what insurance has turned into. In fact, if health or dental insurance was truly insurance, uh, it would cover all dentally necessary treatment. That's not what it covers today. There would be no time limitations. It would actually be geared to what the patient actually needed. We wouldn't have to do a bunch of utilization review trying to decide if the doctor had, had picked the right treatment or not and we would cover the complete replacement of whatever had been lost. That's what insurance really is, but that's not what we find in the uh, health and dental uh, insurance marketplace today. In fact, employers offer what they call uh, assistance plans, or even some people will refer to them as prepayment plans. But it is uh, a third-party carrier or a dental insurance company that pays 50 cents out of every dollar. And then last year in the United States, it was approximately $100 billion spent on dentistry. So 50 billion of those dollars came from a third party or an insurance company. Uh, these products do have time limitations. They do sometimes seem like one size fits all as the philosophy there. There are certainly no accidental clauses in uh, dental insurance contracts. And those are important concepts to understand as we uh, look at insurance and we want to cuss those who have created these plans. This is just kind of a short timeline, a history of some things that you might find interesting. My grandparents were born in the 1800s. Many of your grandparents or great-grandparents probably were also. The number one reason in the United States that cited for committing suicide in the 1800s was tooth decay or tooth pain. And uh, some of us might uh, remember from dental school about uh, learning from early dentists in early America who would actually ride horseback into town and they would uh, do extractions from horseback. There were a couple of really good reasons for doing that. One, it provided a great deal of leverage for you to get those teeth out quickly. 
Number two, when half the job broke with it, it gave you a quick escape out of town. <laughs> but that was the consequence not long ago, only a couple of hundred years ago, uh, people were killing themselves over tooth pain. Uh, we all probably think that we grew up with uh, great dental hygiene, understanding dental hygiene, knowing that we should brush twice a day. But that was really introduced to the soldiers during World War II. The United States Army, when these people were out in foxholes for weeks at a time, and developing what then became known as trench mouth, because they weren't brushing their teeth, the uh, U.S. Army asked the soldiers to all brush their teeth twice a day. And as they came home from World War II, they brought that new habit back to the rest of the members of their family. So it was really just at the uh, 1940s in the United States that we began to brush our teeth uh, uh, twice a day and to think about modern dental hygiene. It was just shortly after that that we began to fluoridate water supplies in the United States. In 1950 is when we were first started uh, expanding and sharing that education with others that tooth decay is a bacterial infection. It's not the hidden bugs and it's not because I forgot to brush my teeth or ate a Snickers bar, but it really is a bacterial infection and we can treat it as such. Dr. Mackinnon's great work in the uh, 70s and the introduction of xylitol into uh, chewing gum at about 1975 was a great advance and one that a lot of you may not be very familiar with, but uh, we've got stem cells in every living tissue of our body. And these are adult differentiated stem cells, meaning that if I take a stem cell from my tooth, it wants to grow another new tooth. However, we've learned ways where we can take those teeth and erase their memory, and we can get a tooth stem cell to grow an ear or to grow some other body part. And in fact, the stem cells inside of our teeth can grow bone, cartilage, organs, nerves, vessels. Uh, so they're very uh, uh, easily able to create the rest of the body when introduced uh, in that uh, environment. It was in 2009, shortly after a, an episode, Nate, on the Today Show, where I was explaining to them one of the values of uh, when your children lose their baby teeth, you may want to uh, talk about cryogenically freezing one of those teeth. Why would you do that? Because it's full of stem cells that could later treat lots of conditions that that child might develop. And uh, I was on with uh, Matt Lauer and uh, Nancy Snyderman, and they were uh, actually making fun of the whole concept that your teeth tooth stem cells could be used to do anything. And the, a little girl that I brought on the show with me, a 12-year-old girl, had juvenile diabetes. And kind of the end of that segment, they go, Nancy Snyderman is saying, you know, this gir little girl's family hopes that the tooth fairy someday will bring her the greatest gift of all, a cure for her diabetes. But they laughed and mocked about it. They didn't think it was possible. Six months later, November of 2009, uh, from human tooth stem cells, we created some beta insulin producing cells. So we've got a great first step to uh, the cure for diabetes and it came from human tooth stem cells. We can create those from other stem cells in the body, but uh, they're readily available from the teeth. So this is kind of dentistry. It's going a long ways. There's a lot of education out there that we need to talk about. It's also a very expensive disease. In 2004, it was the number two most expensive single patient treated disease in the United States. This is 2007, so I'm going back to 2004 first. And in 2004, it was second only to cardiovascular disease and the treatment for that. These are the numbers that were released uh, from the uh, US federal government for 2007, which all of a sudden treating cancer has become the number one leading disease and cardiovascular has dropped down even with dental treatment for number two. So in 2007, we had about $100 billion that we spent in the United States for uh, the uh, direct patient care of cancer, but it was over $80 billion for dental and for cardiovascular disease. 
And you might recall that I just mentioned that in 2010, dental went up to 100 billion. So there are a lot of dollars. This is a very expensive part of our healthcare system is treating uh, all the effects of dental decay. For the dentists and the hygienists in the room, you might be familiar with this person. This is Dr. G.V. Black, and G.V. Black is known as the father of uh, restorative dentistry or modern dentistry. And he has a quote which all of us learned in dental school. My son uh, graduated a year or so ago from dental school, and he was taught this quote also. Now there's two famous quotes by G.V. Black. At the very end, you're gonna see his second one, which I was never taught in dental school. But here is his first one. And it was a uh, mode of treating dental decay called extension for prevention. And what it meant is G.V. Black, in his day, he was practicing dentistry in the uh, late 1800s, the early 1900s, and before we had fluoridation and before we had regular tooth brushing, and he had patients who, when they had the bacterial infection, when they had the strep mutan uh, and high colonization in their mouth, he would see these patients and he would drill out and, uh, the grooves of the tooth and put a filling in. You know, we didn't do six month recalls in those days. So the next time they had a toothache, they came back in and he would find that there was just recurrent decay around that filling and it was spreading, it appeared. And so his philosophy of extension for prevention was let's just wipe out, if we find somebody at high risk early on, rather than doing a little filling first and then treating it again and again and again, let's just treat the whole tooth at once. So they would obliterate all the grooves and surfaces and put a large filling in. Extension for prevention. Now, uh, this is an ad that was run in the Boston Globe uh, almost a decade ago now but uh, got a lot of attention because it said a doctor can detect early signs of diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. Well, no duh. I mean, isn't that what we hope that doctors can do? But then it said, especially if that doctor is a dentist. And it went on to list that there are over 120 signs of systemic disease that can be manifest in the mouth first and that your dentist could pick up signs of during a routine dental exam. And of course, it does cover the uh, dental decay and it covers the periodontal disease and it covers the oral cancers, but also covers a lot more. And in fact, there's about a quarter of all new cases of diabetes each year in the United States are found first in the dental office and that patient is questioned. They are at high uh, likelihood to have diabetes and they're referred to their physician for the diagnosis and the treatment. So a dentist is an integral part of the healthcare system and should be. And there are many things that a dentist should be uh, looking for. Well, I immediately started getting uh, phone calls from dentists who would say, what the heck, Doyle? Did I sleep through that class in dental school? Because I don't know 120 different diseases I'm supposed to be looking at. So we uh, produced a nice little manual of the 120 different symptoms and what they should be looking for in the early manifestations in the mouth and presented it to them. And after most dentists, even those of you here in the room who might think you don't know 120 diseases, if you started looking through the list, you'd find that, oh yes, I do remember the lichen planus, I do remember you know, the uh, folic acid deficiencies, I remember this, that, and the other. So uh, it's not that scary uh, to most of us. So I had been told uh, many times that uh, in Chinese medicine that they did not believe in paying a doctor for treating disease. And I thought that was very odd. So I went to search and find out why and I found this uh, statement uh, that's attributed to Confucius. And uh, it's going to tell us about the level of doctors and their knowledge base and who they should be treating. And so I'll start from the, from the uh, bottom uh, it says a inferior doctor treats actual sickness. A mediocre doctor attends to impending sickness. So you at least go from worse to mediocre if you at least see the signs and you go, oh, you do have high blood pressure. You do have decalcification. You have signs of it. So now I'm going to start treating the disease. But it's the superior doctor who prevents sickness. And this is a philosophy that I think we've heard a lot over this week here at the conference. We're really trying to have very early intervention 
and we would like to change the outcomes, not wait and treat the disease symptoms. So as uh, Joe first announced, and as we've said a few times uh, this week, we coined a word a few months ago uh, at my company called Preventistry and the Preventistry approach. And it really is where we want to look at uh, outcomes and are there things out there that we could change or influence through insurance benefits. And so we created a website, preventistry.com. Uh, there's a word of the week. I didn't do this on purpose, Nate, but I just happened to notice this morning that the word of the week on this particular week was xylitol. So uh, it, it is an educational. There are uh, clips there to help uh, educate and talk about preventistry and why we think it is so important that we reach out and provide something other than one size fits all. We really want dental insurance to be uh, triggered by events to be related to the risk factors that people suffer from and they should be unique to each individual uh, patient. We also created uh, many uh, educational materials for our members so when they have a triggering event so if they go into the to the dental office and they're treated for some symptom whether it is scaling or root planing showing that they've got uh, a gingivitis or a periodontal disease starting whether they're having a cavity filled uh, we send them a unique uh, one of these uh, educational materials back with their explanation of benefits that helps them understand on a very uh, easy reading level that if I just had a cavity and I wouldn't like to go through that again, here are the steps I can go through to prevent. And uh, yes, we've got a beautiful brochure on xylitol that uh, we promote uh, readily. Uh, most people we ha in our office where we have about 500 employees at the particular office that I'm uh, officed at, uh, we've got gumball machines all over the office and they're gumball machines, of course, with xylitol gum in them. And many visitors will come to a dental insurance company and see gumball machines and go, are you guys whacked? You know, what are you thinking having people chew gum? And then we get to tell the uh, xylitol story. Uh, it was interesting how uh, I first got introduced to Nate. I was actually working with another xylitol company, uh, a competitor of theirs. Uh, on the first time that we needed to go on and speak on the uh, Today Show and speak about children's health and how we can prevent it with xylitol, it was during Yankee Dental and Nate was there uh, uh, with his uh, exhibit. I was there talking to the producers who said, uh, we really need you to come down right away and do this and we need you to send all the products you're going to show right away. So I walked over to Nate and I said, can you give me a whole box of stuff that I can send down to the show? And so we were able to go on quickly thereafter and show all the uh, clear products. Uh, and it was uh, a, a nice uh, friendship that we were able to develop because of that. Now, what have we found by looking at this preventistry approach, by trying to see what are the, the obvious things? You know, we've got the, the trees so close to us in front of our eyes that we're missing, you know, the, the forest. And so we were looking at groups of individuals. And what we discovered is that if we take children from the time their, their uh, permanent teeth start to erupt, so children from the ages of 6 to 20, 50 cents of every dollar spent, and that includes the money that we're spending for their prevention, which in a lot of children's cases is the, most, the, the majority of the money, but 50 cents of every dollar was treating either the first or second permanent molar with a restoration. Now how sad is that? This is a disease that is preventable. This is a disease that could be stopped early on with uh, sealants, uh, as Dr. Allen and just talked about. If we could put sealants on early uh, and prevent the first uh, restoration put in that tooth, then we could prevent many of these costs for replacing the restorations uh, over and over. And in fact, as we start to look at that cost of the caries process, we find that if cavities aren't prevented with a sealant or with xylitol or with brushing or whatever uh, our uh, families can do for us, then uh, we pay for a restoration first. 
on average, about every eight years, that restoration is going to be replaced and it is going to be enlarged as we drill out the old filling and include the new uh, decayed area. And in fact, if these cavities continue to go untreated, uh, I was in Chicago last week when the story broke uh, about the 17-year-old uh, boy who developed sepsis from a root canal. Uh, he was a uh, fostered uh, child, uh, didn't get uh, regular dental care, had, he, in his words, in his family's, foster family's words, he had lost a filling. So he lost a filling, developed a toothache, went into a, uh, uh, one of the clinics, had a root canal done. We don't know why it was caused, but he developed a sepsis and died uh, last week. Not unlike the Diamante driver uh, story from uh, the state of Maryland. So we really do have to look at these costs and the effect on life and the standards of life. I think it's important that we message. So as any of you who were available in uh, our last conference, I uh, baited and baited and baited these people from clear. As I was moderating some questions, in between every question I'd say, you know, I've been on the Today Show numerous times, but I've never spoken at a clear conference. I know both of the Bushes, both George Bushes who have served as the president, but I've never been asked to speak at clear. <laughs> and so as proof of that, yes, I have been on the Today Show many times, uh, and now finally, I have been asked to speak at the CLEAR conference. And Nate reminds me that he has never been asked to speak at the CLEAR conference. <laughs> and Shirley says, thank goodness, Nate. Okay, so uh, just some of the stories here, some of the messaging. So. Uh, the one in the middle there with uh, Ann Curry does have, you'll recognize all of those Spry products on the table in front. That really was a story about the mother-child transmission. It was about the xylitol interaction and how we can change that. But some of the other, and this one here with Matt and uh, Nancy Snyderman was the one on uh, taking your children's teeth and, and uh, cryogenically saving the uh, stem cells. But a couple of these others that uh, you, may be stories that you're unfamiliar with or, or uh, maybe they're too simple that we don't see how they can affect our patients' lives. But as we go through the uh, cold and the flu season and, uh, uh, you know, you've got bronchitis right now and, and I've heard coughing and sneezing around, you know, and, and we've all got uh, an environment that we live in. Uh, but as we start to spread colds and flu many times, uh, the physicians go on TV every night and they tell us what we can do to stop that spread or help limit the spread. And they tell us there's two things we can do. Every one of you know what they are. Okay, so when you go to cough or sneeze, do it into your sleeve. You know, I guess you'll have a very dirty sleeve. But that's what they tell you to do. And then go wash your hands a lot. So uh, Fox TV asks, you know, we've heard that story so many times, Doyle. Can you think of anything wonderful and unique that dentists should be telling their patients about the spread of flu and colds? And I said, well, you know, we've got this nasty mouth and it's got uh, more bacteria than there are humans on the face of the earth. And the variety of bacteria in our mouth, there's over 400 different species there. So it's a really dirty place and it gets infected with all of these uh, bacteria and uh, problems that are, gonna, that are going to create uh, disease for us. And we love to brush our teeth. And we love to rub all that stuff on our toothbrush. And then we put it on a glass or something on the uh, kitchen sink, and, or I mean on the bathroom sink, right next to somebody else's toothbrush. And we just cross-contaminate from one to another. So we probably didn't sneeze on our children or use the same glass or touch doorknob we probably all brushed our teeth in the same bathroom and put our toothbrushes side by side. So if you don't know this wonderful fact, you can take your plastic toothbrush and throw it in the microwave for one minute and you will have a sterile toothbrush. Okay, that's a great tip for our uh, patients. For those who are using the uh, power toothbrushes, if you throw those in the microwave, you get a little uh, light show because there's a metal retaining ring 
that holds it onto the power handle. You can submerge it in water and then boil it for three to five minutes in there, or you can put it in the dishwasher, which is uh, about as close to a, a sterilizer as we have in our homes, or an easy way that a lot of the power toothbrushes supply now are the blue light sterilizers, and about eight minutes under the blue light will also leave it uh, germ-free 100%. So terrific uh, little stories, little uh, caveats or sub-vignettes that, that we can share with our patients to help them understand that dentistry really is, and dentists, we really are interested in hygienists. I'm a licensed, I'm licensed to practice dental hygiene also, as, as well as being a dentist, but all the dentists are, but uh, we want to take credit if you're gonna clap for hygienists all the time. <laughs> but, these are, but these are wonderful things. We are part of the health profession and we should be uh, sharing this information. Now I wanna tell you a little bit about what we're doing uh, so how can we change insurance? And so we have a, uh, our own dental clinic. It is quite a large dental clinic in Massachusetts that we own, we operate, you know, we uh, use it as our laboratory. When we do studies or read about studies, then we take that information and put it in a dental office. And we want to know when somebody's not paying the subject to do something, will they be compliant? Will they actually do what you ask them to do? And will there be a difference? And if it works there, then we integrate it into our dental contracts. So we have been dispensing xylitol gum at our dental clinic uh, for over 10 years, since 2000. And I asked the, our uh, uh, dental director out there, I said, uh, tell me what you're seeing. And he says, uh, we've seen a great result in remineralization of teeth. Uh, and decreased lesions of teeth, an increased salivary flow, and an increase in oral pH. All positive things that we want. So those have been uh, great results over this 11 year period. Uh, he hopes that he's also uh, developing a healthier biofilm with his patients, although that's not a study that we're performing out there or measuring. Uh, the results, the outcomes are showing that it is a healthier population. But it costs a lot of money to offer benefits. It costs a lot of money to give a 30-day uh, spry pack to every high-risk member. And uh, so we are always searching for somebody we can partner with or help. And that's not uh, going to uh, spry and saying, will you give them to us free? But it is going to somebody who funds a lot of dentistry and say, would you like to be our partner? We really believe that if you spend more money today, because you still have to pay for all the problems that, are, that exist today, but if you'll do that and pay for something else, we really believe that we will reduce costs over the next several years. It won't be immediate. Will you partner with us? And so uh, Susan Fournier, who's been sitting next to me uh, for this conference, but she runs or manages the uh, Massachusetts Public Health Fund, which, uh, em, ma, uh, Employees Health Fund, um, which has about 70,000 members. So that's a, that's a great study size. And uh, she's a uh, believer in uh, Canberra and the concept and what uh, role xylitol plays in that. So she has partnered with us. This is her wellness program that I'm going to talk about. We merely are the administrator for that. But she will be uh, doing a risk assessment on everybody who wants to join into their wellness program. So it's a, an opt-in, a volunteer program. But for her 70,000 members who are willing to opt into this, then those who, following their risk assessment, are at moderate or high risk, they will receive a 30-day pack, education, training in the dental office, and then they will receive some vouchers depending upon their risk status, and they can trade those vouchers back in month two, three, four, five, six for more product. And then they will be able to, to see who it is that's using the product, and then we can help them look at the outcomes for each one of those individuals, and is it changing their outcomes over time. So this is a, a great way for uh, business and for insurance to partner together and to try and, and show 
uh, results that we can later take out to the public and say you will save money if uh, you're willing to do these things. Uh, I've got up there, Susan, that you're going to waive time limits between preventive care. That is true. Okay, so even to the point of saying how often you should be seen will be under the direction of the dental office. So those people who need to come in more often will have no restrictions uh, in their benefits. You can give her a hand for that. That's a great program. Now what we're providing to all dentists, whether they participate or not, is this report. And it's uh, impossible to read from here, so I'm sure you can't read it. But this is a report that will go to each dentist every six months, and it tells them all of their members that are insured under our plan who are at moderate or high risk, and it will list all the prevention that they should have had over the last six months, and then it will have check boxes there, did they, or a date, did they have the treatment or not? So this is almost like a follow-up sheet that will go to dentists every six months going, here are all the people who fell through the cracks. I know you wanted them to come in. I know you gave them a recall card, but they didn't make it. You know, let's both reach out to them again. These benefits are covered. You'll get paid for it. And in fact, what we are doing is putting a million dollars of our money at risk this first year. Well, we, we're, we are going to pay them incentives for uh, providing this follow-up care. So if they can reach a higher level, if they can get up to about 45% of their members, high-risk members, having the preventive treatment, we'll give them half of a bonus. And if they can get up to 65% of their members, we will give them a full bonus, just extra free money, plus paying them for doing all the treatment. But it really is the first ever of its kind, pay for performance in dentistry, or pay for incentive where we're trying to change the preventive uh, actions of these dentists. And then here is the second quote from Dr. G. V. Black that unfortunately I never learned in dental school. But uh, as old as he was, and with his philosophy of extension for prevention, he also said, the day is surely coming, and perhaps within the lifetime of you young men before me, when we will be engaged in practicing preventive rather than reparative dentistry. Uh, when we will so understand the etiology and pathology of dental caries that we will be able to combat its destructive effects. Now that is a forward thinking man, uh, you know, long ago, over a hundred years ago, uh, and he had a philosophy which we are just now starting to embrace. And so in that vein, uh, Shirley, was chatting with me on the bus uh, yesterday and she said, you know, I knew a doctor years ago who had this philosophy that we're all trying to implement today. Let's do more prevention today. The superior doctor is going to prevent tooth decay. And sometimes we have to look backwards to some of these great thinkers to find an idea that maybe was before its time. I'm sure Dr. Mackinnon many times has probably beat his head that uh, we're all sitting around here going, wow, isn't this interesting stuff? You know, where 35 years ago, he was trying to help the world understand. So uh, my last slide is just go back to the future. Go back, let's look at some of the things that have worked, uh, that were before their time. Let's reintroduce the, them, and I believe we will change the outcomes for uh, members. Thank you.